pleasure and honour to introduce Jeremy Tamek. Uh, for those who don't know Jeremy, he is a genius. Um, he taught me how to code. Uh, he, he came to Australia and spent a week with us and uh, basically everything I've ever built from there was because, uh, because of that help and, and the correspondence after that too. So uh, um, he's uh, been, been with Autodesk for many years. He had a quick stint uh, uh, with another company, uh, previously with, with AutoCAD, doing a lot of work with the AutoCAD API. And then obviously as anyone who's ever played with the Revit API knows the building coder. Um, and as that has moved on, now he's uh, looking after the forge and, and helping us all down that journey too. So, um, without yeah, any other further delay, because I'm wasting his time basically, uh, welcome Jeremy Tamek. So, thank you very much. Welcome from me too. Um, who of you is a Revit admin programmer? those who are not, where this is sort of assuming a lot of programming knowledge, you might you'd get some ideas about what use it might be connecting a admin with the cloud. Um, maybe I want to show how easy it is, uh, but I am addressing programmers, so, so yeah, wait. And feel free to ask anything you want at any time. I think we I'll be able to adapt the session length depending on what you're interested in, what aspects you want to focus on. Um, yeah. So, one thing that I'd like to um, explain here is why it might be interesting to connect a desktop application with the cloud, and also in a way why Autodesk is focusing so strongly right now on uh, this Forge platform. So a little bit about what that is about. Also, a lot of people have worried about security in the cloud or putting their designs out into the public. So that's an interesting aspect. Everything I show here is really easy. I'm not an experienced cloud programmer or even an experienced programmer because I'm not working day to day with programming. What I do is mainly just answer questions uh, from people and, and pass information back and forth. I want to do much more programming, but uh, this seems to be the most efficient thing I can do right now. So everything that I'm showing here is either Revit with add-ins that I create myself, or open source components. They just work. If you pick the right ones, they do what you do and they work. Obviously, the, the hard thing sometimes is picking the right ones. Do, do those two things. Or I'm also talking about Forge, which is partially open source and partially not. Um, but in any case, if you pick these right tools, everything is really, really easy and slots into place, and you have very little to do. So, the main job that you have as a programmer or architect or somebody making use of this technology is to make the right choices about what you actually want to achieve and with which components, and then plugging them together and getting it to work should really be very easy. And all of the samples I present here are completely documented, completely open, available online. So you should be able to download them and get started within minutes, actually. You know, download and, and compile and run in, in 10, 20 minutes. Also, the new stuff that I'm using here is based on Forge boilerplate code. And I did spend a couple of days um, putting in my little bits of code into that, on top of that boilerplate. But all in all, I maybe added 20 lines of code to what was there already to get it to do what I wanted. So everything is already in place. Yo, let's dive in a bit. So one thing that's totally obvious and especially obvious in buildings is that there's a huge number of people who might be interested in information about the model. So imagine an airport with hundreds of thousands or millions of people walking through 
and they just want to know how to get from A to B, or thousands of people might be working there just want to say, hey, that light bulb there is, is broken. And these people are obviously not going to start up Revit to add any piece of information to that, or even have a computer, so they really run around with phones, and it would be useful to add bits of information and funnel it through into some kind of system. Could be a bit or could be some other platform. And uh, your job, I guess, is to find optimal workflows to support that kind of streamlined interaction. And um, so that's why you might be interested in getting entire BIM or some of the BIM out of Revit, off the desktop, onto a platform that makes it accessible to a large number of people or even a huge number of people, or the entire world, whatever. Um, the technology that this is based on here, um, yeah, Revit, Forge, and glue code, connected custom components, and open source bits and pieces. Obviously the internet, the cloud, we have the option to limit that to our own intranet, or even run stuff on the computer with, that, with no connection at all to the cloud or in a local area network. All of the stuff that we show here that is not Forge itself can be limited anywhere. Forge does um, access the internet and needs to authenticate on Autodesk servers. So that really requires an internet connection and I hope it's going to work here. Um, what really revolutionized the possibility of having working with complex graphics in any kind of mobile device was WebGL. WebGL is what is used in the Forge Viewer to display the models, and that is a really powerful rendering environment which basically is built into HTML5, so, and now available on any mobile device. Um, so different levels of security and how to handle that. In my samples, security on the internet can be really complicated. And uh, we keep hearing about new hacks. I just had a problem uploading my blog post yesterday because I would enter a certain string in a certain situation in the blog post and bam! Uh, I got to 404, not found, and the entire website was gone, every time. And the solution after some support calls with TypePad ended up being escaping the C, the letter C, in the word C-U-R-L, which is a Unix command. So they obviously built in some kind of protection into my editor for the blog post, and if I entered C-U-R-L in a certain context, they assume, hey, this guy's trying to hack us. Bang. We're gone. <laughs> uh, it took a while to figure out, and it's sort of weird. I don't understand how they got that idea, but anyway. Ah, actually, I'll go right back and say, here on the first page, there is this link. So the material that I'm showing here is um, available online, I just posted it. So here's the handout and slide deck. And the issue I had yesterday is um, on the blog as well, in case anybody is interested in this weirdness. So <laughs> this is the discussion of the problem and, and this is the solution. So all of these C's here are actually not C's, but escape characters. Anyway, back to the presentation. So, about protection and privacy and so on. In, in my previous samples, I never worried about privacy at all. Um, but if you tie together components like Dropbox or MongoLab, they obviously do deal with security. 
and so does Forge. And Forge provides um, full programmatic access to the authentication process. So there are these two different flavors of it, a two-legged, in which I authenticate myself or my application to access my data. But I also want to write applications for my users to access their data. And that means the three-legged authentication, which means in my application I say, hey, user, authenticate yourself in order for you to select your model, and then I can access the model. And all, that is all available in Forge. And this latest version of this connection demonstration that I'm showing makes use of that three-legged OAuth to download an arbitrary selected model from A360. So the user has to log in to A360, pick the model, and then the demo runs in his or her model uh, and not in something that I hard-coded in. So anyway, I haven't dealt with security, but if you use the right components, you get that as well. In the original samples that I started with, before Forge was there and all of this Autodesk support came along for the web, um, I was just creating my own little visualization, extremely simplified, reducing the data to the max uh, to yeah, be able to manage it and understand it for myself, present it to the user, enable the user to interact with it, and get back into the bin a minimal, minimal little piece of what got changed. So that's really one thing you need to think about. What do I need to optimize this workflow? How can I minimize it and how can I keep it as simple as possible and do as little work myself as possible? That's actually a, a very important basic philosophy for all programmers. The lazier you are, the better your code will be and the less mistakes you make. Because <laughs> These are really things to keep in mind here. Larry Wall is a very famous program. He invented lots of tools. And the other guys there are unknown as well. <coughs> so these are the three samples that I want to show. Who has seen uh, any of these before? Yeah, OK. So it will be interesting for you. Uh, the simplified 2D BIM room editor is by no means a BIM editor. And the intention of this whole connection thingy is absolutely not to try to modify the BIM uh, in the web, because that's way beyond, that's what Revit is there for. And Autodesk doesn't see any alternative right now. Um, the Forge ecosystem of web services does include one service called, um, I forget the name right now, but it enables modification of DWG files. So for DWG we do have a sort of web editing functionality starting to appear and Fusion is the same thing basically for mechanical uh, models. So, and we are thinking about doing something for building models as well, but it's still up in the cloud and being discussed. And we are eager for input. So, I have a link in this presentation asking for your input. If you want to modify or create BIM models on a server in the cloud, generated automatically somehow or modified automatically, then uh, we're happy to talk with you about that. So this 2D BIM room editor extracts some information from the model, presents it to the user graphically using SVG, which is a 2D, it's actually a 2D or 3D graphics format, but it's like HTML for, for graphics. It's called scalable vector graphics. 
and enables editing that and transporting the changes back to the bin. Fire rating in the cloud was um, this first sum that I created. I started from zero. I had no idea what I was doing. And I just Googled for cloud database and discovered a whole new topic called NoSQL, um, which is basically the modern database paradigm beyond um, SQL and transactional relational databases because they do not scale well enough to support things like Twitter or Amazon. Um, but I've, as I, and when I did that, I stumbled on CouchDB and used CouchDB to implement this thing. And CouchDB is by Apache. So it's a web server and a database, all rolled into one. And that is sort of neat, but it's also a little bit strange for me at least, not being an expert in these things. And um, therefore, all the newer samples are based on Node.js and MongoDB, which separate those two pieces into different components and make it, at least for me, easier to understand. So fire rating in the cloud is really super, super simple for, um, and based on Node.js and MongoDB. Who here knows the fire rating SDK sample in, provided in the Revit SDK? Almost nobody. Yes. Yeah, okay. Doesn't matter, but this is simply an extension of that. I'll dive into that more. And finally, this Room Edit 3D is the Forge based version of the whole thing. Um, as said, I'm not suggesting that you do any BIM creation in the cloud. If you want to do so, there is a topic group on the building code asking for your input on that. But uh, this presentation deals with something much, much simpler, just connecting little individual bits of data. So let's let this uh, room editor try it out and keep a track on the time. Oh, yeah, good. Um, so I'm in, uh, this is Windows. And I'm trying to get that to go full screen. Oh, yes. I'm trying to get that to go full screen, and I'll stop debugging, whatever I was debugging. I mostly use Visual Studio to start and stop <coughs> Revit. So um, I'll just switch to the um, Room Editor app. This application is, is kind of complicated. You see it has a lot of modules here, but that has to do with me playing around a lot back then when I started implementing it to extract the 2D geometry, project family instances onto the XY plane to generate the SVG output for them. So I'll simply say, run this application, and it loads up starts up Revit and starts up a stupid, simple model which, uh, whose only purpose is to actually define a room and a couple of furniture instances in it. And the, this information about the room geometry, 2D, and the furniture uh, geometry is extracted and published to a cloud database. And the idea of a cloud database is you could have millions of records in there and you could support all your projects in one single thingy. Uh, so let's go to that add-in. This is the room editor add-in. I'll try to drag that out. Okay. First let's talk about the I know, the fire rating is another thing. So, this has a couple of commands, actually just, basically just three commands. Upload information to the cloud. It gets modified in the cloud or edited. Uh, retrieve the 
update the information back again to update the BIM, or subscribe to changes. So these updates created externally can be uh, update the BIM in real time. This is just a wow effect. You probably wouldn't want this in real life, actually. So I'll simply upload a room, for instance this one, that's the easiest one, say finish, and go to a browser. And in this case I have the... Um, uh, aha! Okay, ah yes. Where did it go? Wait, I'll do that again. I wasn't thinking. So finish. Ah, yes. So I selected a room and all the furniture that it contains and I created this um, little 2D visualization showing what I actually exported to the database. This room has a hole in it, not really important. You can see a funny little detail in the furniture here if you look really closely. This is a desk. And um, you can see the handles of the drawers sticking out there. That's because I generated the 2D representation myself from the 3D. So, yeah, it's more complex than it should be. And what this did is it exported the information about the model, the levels, the rooms on the level, and the furniture in this room to the cloud database and set a certain number here to know at what position are we in time in the database. And changes from now on will be applied. So if I go to the database and say refresh, you can see this room is, um, this is what I exported. And there's a, a certain hierarchy in here, so I have these relationships between the models, the rooms, the levels, and so on. And now I can go and edit that and say save the changes. And if I go in here and say update furniture, the desk has changed. And if I go one step further and say I want to subscribe to changes, now it's basically pulling the database and using that sequence number remembering what was the last situation and I'm interested in all the changes, all subsequent changes. Um, so now I need to go back there, make that smaller, move that around, save it and it immediately updates. So that's really all it does. The only interesting information thing is how did I um, what, what information did I use to make this happen? And, and that's the fascinating part. The information that I'm sending back and forth is minuscule, and also the code required to make this happen is tiny. The, the Revit added part is a bit big there because of the export that I explained, but actually updating this is not a big deal. Um, yeah, no SQL databases are what sort of... There's a thing called a uh, CAP theorem, which was proved... It's a mathematical theorem proven, I don't know, decades ago, at least one or two or three, which proves that transactional databases cannot scale. It's kind of obvious. And things like Twitter or Amazon eBay and so on are completely inconceivable based on relational databases. And that's when people started creating these new databases which are not based on transactions and can manage much, much more records and they're also fun to work with. Um, so that's what I'm using here, this a NoSQL database. In this first sample it's called CouchDB. And in many of these NoSQL databases are very strongly oriented towards the web. So all of the information is stored in a format called JSON. We look at some examples of that at the moment. It's simply a very minimal way to represent data. Everything is a so-called document. So every, basically every database record is a document. Um, and every document normally, at least in CouchDB, 
has a built-in identifier and a built-in revision number. So every change you make to the database, the database will automatically keep track of that and there's no way to break that system. So if, because of this um, non-relational thing, somebody could go into the database and a thousand users at the same time or a hundred thousand and they could have conflicting updates. But because of these revisions and stuff, that gets managed and sorted out. Um, so, uh -huh. and another thing is, in CouchDB, you define a database design. This database design is also stored as a document in the database itself. So it's quite funny, and it's also easy to um, replicate a database because the database itself stores its own description, definition. You push a button, the description goes across, all the other documents go across, everything is a document, and you have everything somewhere else, or in many other places, um, and it's a really safe uh, and in, uh, integrity-maintaining kind of system. And to view these documents, you define views, and that's what I had to do to implement this little web page that we saw. So, um, if I go to Windows, this thing here is just an. It, there's one single file here called index.html, and it uh, only consists of a couple of lines of code, and those lines are then expanded using JavaScript, and this stuff down here is displayed using the SVG, Simple Vector Graphics. Um, and the information that I'm picking out of, the, of Revit is the structure that I described, the relationships between model, level, room, family instance, and the geometry of the family instance. And the room also has geometry. And the geometry, um, well, the room has the boundary loops and yeah, can contain holes. It's not that interesting. The family symbol, I, I created geometry for family symbols to have one single outer bounding loop, just for the sake of simplicity. And what I'm editing there, I'm not editing the geometry of these family instances, just their location and rotation. And therefore I can use the structure given to me by Revit saying the family symbol defines geometry and the family instance defines the location. So, um, and then I have the relationships between these objects. So the family instance lives in a room which lives on a level, which lives in a model. Remember, this whole design is set up to manage thousands of models with tens or hundreds of levels each, with tens or hundreds of rooms on each level, with tens or hundreds of furniture instances in each room. So, any number of documents. So I really need some kind of sensible hierarchy to filter out what I'm really interested in. And the family instance is represented as a symbol. And each of those has a corresponding database, definition, and identifiers, which define those relationships. And some of them have the geometry that we can see, and that's defined by SVG. So here, for instance, we have a sample saying we have a rectangle, with a position and a width and a height. And we have a path with a definition which says move to a certain point, line to another certain point, line to another certain point and close. And that's what I use to display this room information and this furniture information. And then that gets packaged into these JSON documents. So there's the identifier and the revision number automatically generated. 
I call it the loop, is the geometry. So you can see how all of this minimized geometry can be really easily represented in ASCII. There's no binary stuff or weird formats. It's all just little snippets of text that get sent around and that, that present exactly what we need to know and nothing else. I have a type that's used for filtering the um, relationships and the elements and then some additional information. Same, yeah, for... Then there's this transform. Ah, yes, the furniture document is the most interesting one, obviously, because it has relationships both to the room that it lives in and to the symbol that defines its geometry. And it also has this transform, which is what we actually edit when we drag it around on the screen. So there's a rotation, minus 90 degrees, and a translation of so and so much. And then there's the view that we use to extract this information out of the database. As said, there can be millions of records in the database, and these NoSQL databases often uh, handle the possibility or implement the possibility to query that information very, very efficiently and rapidly by defining views. And these views are little functions that can basically be pre-calculated. So anything you can query the database is already known and therefore can be served up to you extremely rapidly. Because these functions are so simple and are guaranteed not to make any modifications to anything, they're really just query thingies. Um, yeah, that's the basic how it works. And then I define all these, there's a, quite a number of views that I need to define to get this whole system to work, but um, all very trivial. And this is the scaffolding in the index HTML. So you can see how very simple it is uh, in the end, at the top level. And all of these nodes are then simply populated with JavaScript and SVG. So that's all I have to say about the fire rate, uh, about the room editor sample. The fire rating one, I was thinking of diving in a bit deeper into the code because um, it is so simple that we can actually uh, look at the detailed implementation. So I'll close this. I'll shut down that. I'll switch to the fire rating cloud sample and start up Revit in this other model. And I have a picture about what it's all about. So the basic principle here is similar. I have a Revit add-in exporting information from the BIM to a cloud database. I have something in the cloud manipulating that data in some way or other. And I have the add-in that puts back in the changes. The original fire rating sample provided by the Revit SDK um, had three commands. To create the shared, a shared parameter representing a fire rating on the door, on all doors. Yeah. So it's just one single number, and that's the only piece of information that this whole sample works with, shoving that piece, that number around the place. Then it exported the fire rating values for all doors, and it does so by in the original sample, it sends them to an Excel spreadsheet and uses the Revit element ID to identify the door. And the element ID is not really a good identifier because it can change if you do things with work sharing or so. Uh, and then it had a third command to import the modified data back from Excel into Revit. So that's a very standard, basic example showing how to export and import data and how to handle a shared parameter. Oh, that's all it does. Now, the extension that I made was use the Revit unique ID 
instead of the element ID. Enable not just one model to be exported, but all models. So I could create a global database worldwide, basically, if I want, or at least for all of my models. Uh, put it in the cloud, and uh, that's basically it. Again, there's a subscribe to changes option there to update the uh, modifications in real time. Um, yeah, and the fascinating part of this is how simple it is. So, I need to, um, so in this. Um, sample. I have an external application which defines the user interface. Let's look at what that user interface looks like. It's very similar to the um, to the room editor. So I have the first command to bind the shared parameter. That's obviously important because otherwise we, it doesn't have any values. So now if we select this door here we'll see that it has a fire rating value. It's, ah, it, it already had the fire rating value set. So it's set to 220. And we can export that to the um, database. There are two commands here for exporting, because the first time I implemented that, uh, I made an HTTP call for each individual door. And, um, because, because it was, yeah, because I wanted to uh, be careful about overwriting existing values in the database, and there was no database function that I could find to not overwrite existing values and yet process lots of records at the same time. So I implemented this one by one transport, but then somebody said, hey, I have a model here. Other doors, and this is taking hours. So then I implemented the export by batch, which simply says the bin is correct. What's in the database is, can be ignored, overwritten, just bang, and send it out. And that reduces this HTTP call from, or it's a REST API call from one per door to. Uh, one for all doors. And now the nice thing about this is, as said, this is based on, um, on Node. The web server is Node, and the database is Mongo database. And this Mongo database is hosted on a public free Mongo database hosting service. So I can go and look at it in the um, in the browser. And let's say I log out first of all so you can see what this is. I have to log in so I have to provide my credentials. Um, and I have a couple of, I just have these two databases. So this is the fire rating database that that information gets exported to. There are currently 3,000 documents in there, so um, we'll have to figure out how to find the one that we're interested in. Most of these come from a Spanish guy that I was working with in January. And in our model, in this door, we have set... Have we set that? Is that the mark? I think the mark is what we want. API fire rating. I think I want to write Jeremy at that point. Is mark the right thing? Apply export batch. Um, so to select the right one out of these 3,000 records, it would be handy to have a search. And if, ah, if you look at those records, you notice that I use the tag to, a thing called tag to store that mark information. So if I search for everything that has a tag Jeremy, I get just two records. And one of these has fire rating zero, and the other one has 24. What did I have in there? 
done. Is this what I really want? Why doesn't it say 220 export batch? Am I getting messed up here? Did I? Oh, weird. I'm confused with what, whether I'm in the right database. Um, hum, 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 hum. Pardon me? Let's see, I'll delete the entire database because I don't really care. And I'll delete this uh, search as well. And then I, if I export now, it should generate just one record. Ah, yes, okay. Ah, and it has fire rating zero. I wonder why. That's weird. Ah, I said create to buy a shared parameter, and it had one already. Okay, so apparently I can have several shared parameters of the same name. I wasn't aware of that. So let's say th three, four, five. Apply that. Export this information and refresh. And there it says three, four, five. That's exactly what we wanted. Um, and the nice thing about this is, um, this is somewhere in a database hosted somewhere by somebody. And if, if I want to share this kind of information, I have this possibility. You can see it's pretty instantaneous transporting these things back and forth. And I can also have any number of clients using this stuff. So let's first edit that um, from in the database and say we don't want 345, we want to edit this and say 6789, save that, go back to Revit and import this information and you can see how it changed right away. Or we can go one step further again and subscribe to these changes. Here the time stamping is different, so I'm using a, a time stamp and I actually, um, let's for safety's sake, export everything uh, again and update the database just so this time stamp is correctly set up. So you can see I have this modified tag down um, which is a timestamp in Unix time format. And now we'll see, say, 222. And we'll also update this timestamp. I hope I'll do this right. Let's say 500. Save. And update. I, I, and then it should, at a certain point, update. Did it update? Did I have to? What did I say now? 222. Ah, yes, it's updated already. Okay, so it's. It happened. Uh, so um, that's the round tripping of this little piece of information uh, between this external Mon MongoDB database via a web server back into the add-in, back into the BIM. But the nice thing about this is I, I, I can connect with a REST API um, to the Revit add-in, but I can also have other clients and um, one other client that we have available here. Let's see, I can't run that at the same time. Well, I could. Ah, yes, I could just say run instead of debug, I think. I have this fire rating client, which is uh, a Windows form and uses the same interface to access that data. And I can change from anywhere in the world, any other client, whether on Windows, on the desktop, in the web, in the web um, access that same database, make those same modifications. It's just a way of sharing all of this data. 25, okay. 
So let's go on and see what else do we want to discuss. So I have the Revit add-in, I have the standalone client. Aha, and maybe we should take a quick look at the code to see how simple this is. So um, in the Revit add-in, to export the shared parameters, let's look at that. Um, I have an external command. Where is it? Export main. Um, there's the export main. So it determines that we have the shared parameter set up. It also adds a project identifier so that uh, we can filter for projects in case we start adding thousands of them. Um, we have a filtered element collector to collect all doors. Family instances which have the door category. So, so far this is just standard Revit stuff. And then we have two functions here, export batch or export one by one. Let's go to the one by one. And it says I want to create for each element in this uh, retrieved set, I instantiate a thing to contain the door data. which, And then I use a utility function put to write that to the database. So let's look at how easy it is to get that door data. I get the document, I get the unique ID, just the information, the tag is this uh, mark, and the level and the fire rating is stored there, plus the timestamp. And then, so, so far nothing has happened which is nothing at all specific, but this is the interesting one then, the put call to actually send this to the database. And I have here, um, I set up, I have to instantiate a REST client based on the URL that I'm addressing. I have a switch here to toggle between a local URL for testing purposes if I have no interconnect, internet connection or if I want complete security, I can cut off the internet totally. You know, this could be a local area network or something. Or I have the global URL and I can toggle between local and um, global simply by setting one single variable. So that's the URL that I'm using. And this URL is going to the web server, first of all. So again, to look at this, all of the information goes through the web server and that communicates with the database. Um, and then um, I set up a REST request with the information that I want to send and the URL, and I, I send that. And that's it. Where do you format the uh, document, the JSON format? Um, here. Request format is JSON. Um, actually, my door data. Um, ah, yes. I think what I do is when I say, oops, where did it go? Where did the put go? Let's go to the put. So here I create this um, C-sharp class, which has some public fields. Um, are they public? Aha, yes, they are public. This door data thing is my Revit API version or, or flavor of the door data. And the actual door data, I have here three different um, projects. One is the Windows form client, one is the Revit API client, and have this utility library at the basis of it all, which is independent of everything. And in this utility library, I define a base store data class. And it has the information that I wish to communicate as public properties. And those public properties get automatically formatted to JSON by that um, put call 
by the I think it's the um, rest sharp I yes rest sharp library so this is a C sharp the .NET C sharp library for REST communication, and it does it automatically for me. So this is a typical example. I've struggled a lot with that stupid JSON formatting in previous versions, and if you, you use the right tool, it's all done for you, and you don't have to worry. So that, that's really the challenge, finding the exact right tool and not doing a single line of code that isn't really, really necessary, because everything has already been done by somebody else. Exactly what you need has already been implemented a hundred times over. And much better than I ever will, anyway. Um, so, it's, it is very, very minimal. I'd also like to look at the web server implementation that's here. Um, because it's, it's, this is the entire server source code, sort of the main thing. There are a couple of other modules involved. I'll go there. Fire rating. Um, so, yeah, you can. Can I make this bigger? Yes, I can. So, I have um, my server my routes, which define the API paths. I have a controller, um, or the model is um, what goes into the database. And if you will see, it's not exactly rocket science. Or I have the controller. Well, the roots are also interesting, I guess. Uh, so these are the API calls that I can make to my web server. <laughs> and then the web server has to communicate with the database. And that's what this controller thing does. And here, for each of these functions, I've implemented something um, that grabs the information passed into the web server and massages it to go and send it over to the database API calls. So it's, this isn't really hard either. I struggled around a bit here because I was fussing about with not overwriting existing records. And that was kind of the only challenge I ever had. Um, so that's that. There's the server that we looked at. There's the uh, database. And now let's quickly look at this um, forge aspect of things. Everything I showed so far was Revit plus 100% open source and also 100% super simple. Minimal, minimal information. Absolute no brainers. The brain is in chopping away everything that you don't need. Everything. Uh, now I'll turn a little bit to Forge because that has other advantages which also make it very simple for a developer um, and add a lot of richness if that is what you need. It really depends on your needs. If you need something really, really simple and you want total full control yourself, or do you need something richer, more mature, bigger, uh, and, and uh, possibly give up some control? So this Forge thing is a platform, a development platform, empowering developers to empower their users. The idea is that with this is not just addressing BIM, this is addressing everything to do with modeling and CAD and design. So what people want to do is they want to design things, make them, visualize them, collaborate in this process and use them. And that is what Forge is about empowering, but not directly to the user as end user as much to the as to the developer community. So what it provides is web services and the viewer. 
And this is an overview of the currently available web services. Um, there's some in beta. There's dozens of others which are not even shown right now on the website. This website is the main entry point for developers. Uh, so it's developer.autodesk.com. And for each of these, if you click on it, it has the full information with samples and uh, API references. What's the requirement for uh, being able to use for Zero. Zero. And is there a cost essentially? Zero. Assuming that we're subscribers to Autodesk. Doesn't care, it doesn't matter. It's absolutely zero requirement and zero cost for starting. There are thresholds. So if you go beyond certain thresholds in some of these areas, then there are costs involved. But for you know initial exploration and also for a small usage, it's zero, zero. Okay, and, and also this part, the viewer is completely open source. So there's, that's also completely free and all liquidity. Um, the other things there um, are things that run partially on the web servers, and you cannot get them onto your server, so you give up a certain control there. And, um, you also need an internet connection, obviously, to access them, and, uh, and there can be a cost involved. I think right now there are some of these three tiers small usage or university research exploration, zero. Then there's a small user, and then there's a huge user, and then there's a subscription cost for those levels. So what these different things do is um, this thing uploads CAD formats uh, and they, there's a huge list of those CAD formats. I don't know whether I included it here. No, I didn't. But it's on the, in the building code where I published it yesterday again, updated it. Actually, that's what I played around with um, and what led to this curl problem before. Uh, that I talked about before, because I made these two curl calls. These are examples of calling Forge services, web services. The first one is to authenticate, and I can actually execute this. So I'm, I'm calling a REST API endpoint called developerapiautodesk.com authentication version one authenticate. And that will give me I'll say forge auth, I have that set up as a script. That gives me lots of information, which I don't really care about here. So you can see the HTTP headers and stuff. And it gives me an access token. And to get this access token, I have to make use of my consumer key and consumer secret, which I have cleverly hidden from you in environment variables. So I have these environment variables set up with secret information that I cannot reveal, but the result is this transient access token. And now I can uh, use this access token to um, pass it into, oops, Um, I'll copy that because it's only valid for I don't know how long. Copy and paste. And now I've set a new environment variable which I can pass into my second script, forge formats. And the second script returns a list of the supported formats. So that changes on a regular basis. And the current list of supported uh, CAD formats looks like this. So there's a lot of formats currently supported for import, and they are all uh, uploaded to this file data management API, and then um, they can be stored on A360, but you can also just if you 
could use this in conjunction with A360. You could use Forge to access models on A360, but you can also use Forge to, to store them in your own so-called buckets, and then they have nothing to do with A360. So it's up to you where they get stored and how they get visited, and who has access to them. They could be your own models, or they could be user models. If you're on A360, they could belong to somebody else, but you can still interact with them. And then there's the, so it minimizes some authentication processes. And then there's a model derivative API which derives information from these models. And so that actually performs a translation for all these dozens of file formats into certain standard formats for the viewer, but also to extract information like properties and structure. As I said, this is not just the BIM. So supporting all kinds of CAD models means you have to have an understanding of structure and properties, which is across all disciplines and across all file formats. And that makes this really, really powerful because it is so global. And the end result, after it's gone through that process, in the viewer is all JSON and JavaScript and open source and accessible. You can get it all and do whatever you want with it. And that's um, what this little uh, Forge-based BIM editor does. Let's um, get that up and running as well. So I'll stop debugging. And I'll switch to a different project which is the Room Edit 3D app. Um, okay. And, ah yes, this is a neat thing because it's based on, on Forge, obviously. Um, do I have a list of where it's, no, it's not, I didn't do that. Um, so I, I created this in a couple of iterations one was sort of, was it last year? Yeah, one was last year, I think. And that was sort of hard coded to a specific model. And I created another version for the Forge Developer Conference in June. But things were pretty much in flux then, and that's not really nice. And the one I've um, implemented now was really, really easy to create because now the Forge ecosystem and web services and so on have stabilized. The documentation is up there and clear and we've got samples that really work reliably and uh, it was extremely easy to, to create what I created uh, based on that. So, um, aha, yeah, I should have added a couple of links. Ah, yes. Um, I added the material here to the uh, blog and I also added a link to this github site and that should have links to everything else so um, this sample is actually a branch of a completely different sample uh, created by Philipp Levsma and uh, implementing Forge boilerplate code. So he goes through these different steps using the viewer offline, uh, a bare bone viewer but online, viewer plus server plus authentication plus derivative services plus I don't even know what that is and explains exactly what you can do to get all of this stuff up and running. And because of the changes I make, I can use his stuff to 100% uh, for the authentication, downloading of the model. And then he's got another set of samples with viewer extensions. So little bits of JavaScript that you can plug into the viewer to add your own functionality. And I make use of one of those as well. Um, so let's go back to my branch here, because that has, I think, the... Um, the link that I want to call IS here. 
So here's the um, sample up and running. I've uploaded it to Heroku. To get access to data, I have to log in to A360. If I was not logged in, then I would have had to enter my credentials at this point, but it's recognized them from cookie or whatever. So I have here access to my information on A360, and there's the room editor model. Do I have to? Oh, yes, double click it. So um, in here, I have the standard Forge viewer. And I have the ability, if you look here, these are sort of, the, is the toolbar provided by default with the Forge system. But I added a start button and that adds another little icon down there. And this, I didn't implement that either. That's all part of Philip's samples. And in his samples he has, this is a transform tool with a translation and the rotation functionality. I only worked with the translation one. And if, if I don't start it and click here, nothing happens when I click on an element, but, or I can get its properties. Does it show the properties somewhere? Properties, yes, I can see all of this Revit stuff. This is just a really cool proof that everything you put into the Revit model is available there in spite of having been reduced to the screen for this web transfer. So the whole model structure and so on, and all the parameters and uh, properties and so on are in there. Um, but if I start my translate tool and click on the thing, then something else happens, because I can now move it around. And that uh, translation is then communicated from the, this extension tool back to the main server and that server broadcasts it to the world on the internet using something called Socket.io and if I know about this URL on which this broadcast is taking place I can subscribe to changes and that's what the Revit add-in does, it subscribes to those changes and picks them up and updates the BIM accordingly. So let's um, start Revit. Oops, 2 minutes 22 seconds left. That's not much. So I'm hoping this is set up to be the same model because I'm identifying the elements that I uh, edit through the unique ID. So that would be, what would it be? None of those. Um, 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 um. Um, ah, I should see it in, no, why isn't it set up in the, um, Ah, yes, I think it's room edit 3D, it must be that one. Open. This. So I'm opening the same model in the viewer. And again, I have these add-ins. And in this case, I think I just have a, a command to toggle this subscription. So once I've subscribed to the changes, um, I should be listening for the broadcast generated by the web server and updating the Revit model accordingly. So let's, um, now we have to display the Windows window with the Revit model at the same time, hmm, this is a bit fussy, ah, there we are, that should be okay. And now if I make that a bit smaller, I wonder if I can, that should be smaller, should have set this up in advance. So, uh, yeah, should work. Now I want to move this wall around. 
And I may need to click on the Windows window. Hello. Oh, yes. Ah. So you can see the information was translated across and the BIM updated in real time. Oops. Uh, Yo. So, do we have any more slides? And um, the advantages of a Forge based app. I, I already talked about minimal do it yourself. And total control versus Forge provides you this rich, complete model of everything, plus a whole ecosystem of other mature related web services. In both cases, minimize the amount of coding you do. With Forge, it's easy based on the boilerplate code. Here are the links to all the repositories. I put them on the blog today. So um, if you go to today's blog post, you have all those links really handy, plus a picture of Anthony. <laughs> and uh, that's it. We have a couple of minutes for questions, I'm not sure. But otherwise, I'll be around. You can come and talk with me. I don't want to block the next person presenting. Anything urgent? Or will you just, yeah? Um, I'll just say first off, uh, thanks for the building poker, because that's been a really important part of the uh, uh, kind of ecosystem and community for a long time. So thanks for that. Uh, the question is, Beyond just the uh, links that you showed on GitHub and those samples, uh, where can we find um, what else people are doing? Like, you know, like what outside the box, in terms of it being like kind of open source and uh, et cetera, is it, is it all one central place or, or where can we find what's going on? You mean what's other than that? Yeah. Than that. Um, yeah, I One thing you can do, which, I mean, you can always write to us and ask, definitely. And the whole support for this Forge platform is based on Stack Overflow, which makes it more uh, programmer oriented than the auto desk discussion forums that we use for the Revit APIs there. Um, and. I mean, there's the Autodesk places to go and look. That's developer.autodesk.com and forge.autodesk.com. And they have links to samples, documentation, discussion forums, community stuff. And then there's all the blog, blogs, not just by me, but by my colleagues as well. There's one for the cloud and mobile stuff. So Guys like Philip, who wrote the sample that I based in this one, they, they publish stuff there a lot. Yeah, those are the main places to go with it. I'm no program, but I could follow up on Mark's point of your explanation. Right. But it's also possible if you get this, this example of the furniture, that the user could change uh, one furniture into another type of furniture. That's just moving completely up to you. Yes, okay. everything is possible. Pay a lot of attention not to do anything stupid. <laughs> but yes, absolutely, it is possible. If you have a workflow for which that makes sense, it is totally easy. You, can, you could do that in half an hour based on this. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. The opportunities, the, the possibilities here are absolutely boundless and it is really, really easy to do. <laughs> yeah, I really look forward to hearing what you end up doing with it. So I think that's a good place to stop. Thank you very much. Enjoy the conference.